Week 8, Lesson 1, Spider-Man and Drugs When we last looked at Spider-Man, the series had grown stagnant. The characters seemed eternally stuck in university and had to keep overcoming many misunderstandings. It was clear that Spider-Man had lost the edge that Ditko gave the character. Amazing Spider-Man, issue number 88, started a multi-story that ended with the death of Gwen Stacy's father, Captain George Stacy. Spider-Man was in a fight with his potential arch-villain, Dr. Octopus, when some debris comes falling onto the street and killing Captain Stacy. As he dies, Captain Stacy reveals to Peter that he knows he's really Spider-Man. This death was the new status quo for the series and gave it some momentum again. Spider-Man was receiving such notice that it got the attention of President Nixon's White House. At the time, the government was looking at a way to decrease drug use in America's youth. And someone in power thought that having Spider-Man teach children about the dangers of drugs would have a huge benefit. Marvel's office got a call from the Nixon administration and Stanley accepted. He teamed up with then-artist John Romita Sr. and they wrote an issue where Spider-Man finds out that one of the students at his university did some drugs that made him think he could fly. Spider-Man saves him from falling off a building and that's the end of it. It made drugs look bad. Spider-Man was not promoting drugs. And it was a lesson to kids that drugs were bad. So, Stan Lee sent the work into the Comic Code Authority, and they rejected it. When Stan Lee asked why it was rejected, since the rules of the Comic Code Authority didn't exclude drug use, the Comic Code Authority claimed that violated the clause which stated, All elements or techniques not specifically mentioned herein, but which are contradictory to the spirit and intent of the code, and are considered violations of good taste or decency, shall be prohibited. Stan Lee tried to explain that even though drugs were used, they only showed the negative consequences of taking them, and that the White House requested that they tackle the subject. But the Comic Code Authority refused to approve it. Furious, Stan Lee went to Martin Goodman, who suggested that they release it without the Comic Code Authority's stamp of approval. So, in 1971, The Amazing Spider-Man, issue number 96, was released without the Comic Code Authority's approval. It was a commercial and critical success. The Comic Code Authority saw how people responded and realized that if it didn't change its rules quickly, it'd become completely obsolete. What happened was that they eased up on what was allowed to be published. All of a sudden, comics could tackle the subject of drugs again. Monsters like vampires, zombies, and werewolves were also allowed to be published. The results of violence were able to be shown, so blood became more common. If something was allowed to be shown on primetime television, it was also allowed to be shown in comics now, too. Once again, Spider-Man changed the industry. But Stanley's work on Spider-Man didn't stop there. In the very next issue, it was revealed that Peter Parker's roommate, Harry Osborn, was doing drugs. It wasn't a random student on campus this time, either. It was a character who'd been around for years, who was now suffering the effects of the drugs, which there was no instant solution for. In issue number 99, Spider-Man focused on the unfair treatment of prisoners in America and tried bringing attention to the matter. We hadn't seen social awareness like this in comics since the earliest adventures of Superman. The lightening up of the rules for the Comic Code Authority is usually cited as the end of the Silver Age of Comics and the beginning of the Bronze Age of Comics, where more complex heroes face a more complex world. After issue number 100, Stan Lee left Spider-Man, but returned five issues later since his replacement was getting bad feedback from the readers. His return to the book was nothing special, and eventually he left the writing in the hands of Jerry Conway and artist John Romita Sr. On issue number 119, John Romita Sr. left and was replaced by the artist Gil Kane, who was the main artist from the early Silver Age Green Lantern stories. By the time Gil Kane started working on the book, Jerry Conway was trying to think of a way to get the series noticed again. He realized that if you kill off a character, people would start talking about a book again. He looked at all the major people in Peter Parker's life and realized that for the biggest response, he'd have to kill off Peter Parker's main love interest, Gwen Stacy. The editor approved it and even called Stan Lee, who was vacationing in Europe at the time, who also approved it. To this day, Stan Lee doesn't recall approving the decision. In June 1973, in The Amazing Spider-Man issue 121, the Green Goblin had regained his memory and remembers that Peter Parker and Spider-Man were one and the same. 
He kidnaps Gwen Stacy, who still doesn't know Peter Parker's true relationship with Spider-Man, and brings her to the top of the bridge, before throwing her off of it. Spider-Man shoots his webs to save her, and stops her from falling, but if we look at the panel, there's a sound effect going snap, right by her neck. Spider-Man brings her up, thinking he saved the day, and then realizes that suddenly stopping her fall had killed her. The next issue, Spider-Man is out for revenge and fights the Goblin. Spider-Man is about to show the villain mercy, but the Green Goblin is planning to send his flying glider to stab Spider-Man in the back. Spider-Man jumps out of the way in time, and the Green Goblin impales himself on the glider. Spider-Man doesn't have to take a life, and still gets his vengeance. This was another permanent change in the status quo. Captain Stacy was dead, and now Gwen Stacy was dead, indirectly, or arguably even directly, because of the actions of Spider-Man. Gwen Stacy was the first significant love interest to die in comics. It would be the equivalent of the Superman titles killing off Lois Lane right after World War II ended. This was a game changer, and romantic interests in the comic books haven't been saved since. Stanley was furious when he came back from vacation and demanded that the writers bring Gwen Stacy back. Everyone in the office disagreed with him and thought that keeping her dead was the right thing to do. Eventually, they compromised and brought back a clone of Gwen Stacy for a few issues, but the clone quickly disappeared, and unless Marvel makes a change between the time we started filming this and the time we've released this lecture video, Gwen Stacy, the original one, has been kept dead ever since. While well, issues number 121 and 122 are considered classics by most comic book fans, the rest of Conway's run was of a mixed quality. However, in February 1974, issue number 129, a new type of hero appeared. A man dressed in black with a skull in his shirt, like the Black Terror had, appeared as he was going to go and try and kill Spider-Man. The man's name was Frank Castle, and was better known to the world at large as the Punisher. The Punisher was originally introduced as an opponent to Spider-Man. He had no powers, but he was tough enough to take on anyone in the superhero community. In his first appearance, the Punisher made a name for himself by declaring a one-man war on the mob, and also went after Spider-Man for a supposed connection to the death of Gwen Stacy. He finds out that Spider-Man didn't kill her, and stops going after him. The character was based off Paul Benjamin from the Brian Garfield book, Death Wish. And, because of the success of the Charles Bronson movie Death Wish, which was released just a few months after The Punisher made its comic book debut, The Punisher found himself becoming a recurring ally of Spider-Man. Spider-Man doesn't like The Punisher's policy of killing villains, but will let him do what he needs to when things get tough. The Punisher was the first hero since the Golden Age of Comics to show that murder was a legitimate option to solve real-world problems. The Punisher could have been introduced in a Captain America or Nick Fury story, but he was introduced in a more family-friendly title like Spider-Man. And while children were no longer the primary audience for the Spider-Man series, there were still a lot of kids reading the comic. It was a subject that the new Comic Code Authority rules allowed them to show, and compared to other types of comics at the time, Spider-Man rarely held back while tackling this issue. Eventually, The Punisher would get his own spin-off series and become one of the most violent ongoing heroes that comics have ever made. So, why is all this important to the course? Stanley forced confrontation with the Comics Code Authority and won, allowing for much greater leniency in what comics were allowed to do. Comics wasted no time in telling more complex stories, creating more complex characters, and having more casualties with no easy solutions to a problem. The relaxation of the comic code also allowed for more violent characters to appear. Stanley's later run on Spider-Man, and Jerry Conway's entire run as Spider-Man, showed the clear transition from the Silver Age of comics to the Bronze Age. 